All right. Well, if you would turn with me to Hebrews chapter 8 tonight. Hebrews chapter 8. We're continuing on with uh, going through the uh, book of Hebrews. And uh, we'll remember that last week uh, we looked at the uh, fact that Christ is a better priest than all those priests that came out of Levi, the uh, priests that were according to the law. And uh, we saw that because uh, Christ was uh, uh, after a different order of priests, namely after the order of Melchizedek, uh, that he uh, preceded them, uh, that his priesthood, his office that he uh, does on the cross for us, uh, came before and so was greater than Levi. And we saw that because he was made a priest according to the oath or the promise of God, uh, that therefore Christ's office of priest uh, is an eternal priesthood. And so uh, he uh, was, a, was a better priest than uh, they were. And so uh, with that, we're looking now at the work that Christ does as a priest. And that is the uh, uh, office that he does as uh, giving himself as a sacrifice for sin and by that establishing a new covenant in his blood. And so with that, we'll just begin reading in uh, Hebrews chapter 8 and beginning in verse 1 together. The scripture says, Now of these things which we have spoken... This is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. So he's just summing up what we've seen so far. He is the great high priest, that he is at the right hand of God in heaven, that he serves in the true tabernacle, the sanctuary of God. And in verse 3 he says, For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore it is necessary that this man have somewhat also to offer. Since he's established that Christ is a priest, and a be, uh, according to a better priesthood than the Levitical priesthood, he says that priests have something to offer. They offer sacrifices and offerings, and so Christ also has something to offer. And this is what he'll tell us about. In verse 4, For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve also the, unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mountain. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. He says uh, if he were an earthly priest, after carnal things, just as the uh, Levitical priesthood was, they offered uh, earthly sacrifices, uh, temporal sacrifices, sacrifices that did not last, then if he were after their order, then he would not be a better priest. But seeing he is of a better order of priests, he is able to offer. And he says that they served after the example and shadow of heavenly things. When they went into the a temple, the tabernacle, and they offered uh, offerings and sacrifices. Those things that they offered were a pattern. They were just an image of a true sacrifice that should be made. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed unto thee in the mountain. Uh, when God gave to Moses the law, and what uh, he was supposed to build for the service of God, uh, he says to make it after a pattern, uh, not make it according to the same substance as to what it is, but in a picture of what he was shown in the mountain. And so when they offered 
they were not offering the true sacrifice. They were offering a picture. They were offering a pattern of the, of the sacrifice that should be made. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. So he offers a better thing. He offers the true sacrifice. And as offering that, he establishes a better covenant, the, the new covenant that God gives. In verse 7, For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second for finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. And we're stopping here at the middle of a quotation of the Old Testament. And I'd like us to notice that if he had not found fault with the Old Covenant, if it were able to serve the eternal purposes of God, then there would be no reason to establish a new covenant. If it could uh, save people by its own virtue, then he would not have established a new covenant on its uh, or uh, foundation. He would have just kept that old covenant. But it says, finding fault with them, he saith these things. He found fault with them. He found that they were lacking in some way. Uh, he had given the law, which we know is good, which we know is according to his own uh, moral nature, but it was not able to redeem us because we had broken the law. Because as we break the law, we are punished by the law. And so he found uh, that the utility, we could say, the utility of the old law, the old covenant, was not able to save. But he says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And the reason he says he's making a new one is because they continued not in my covenant. And I regarded them not, saith the Lord. Because they did not continue in it, because they broke it, because we all have broken it, therefore he establishes a new covenant with us. In verse 10, he continues, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities, will I remember no more. The new covenant does not uh, do away with the old law, but it establishes the law. It says that the new covenant is that he will write the law into the hearts of his people, and where they have um, disobeyed the law, he will forgive them of their sins. In verse 13, in that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. And so the uh, new covenant that he has established, he makes the first one old and the old in its uh, uh, services, in its uh, administration of sacrifices and priesthood, it is vanishing away in that regard because he's made a new covenant. This covenant that he makes is unilateral. We see that the uh, that uh, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. God establishes his covenant with his people, a new covenant not according to the old one, which by itself could not save, he makes a new one. 
And this is the passage that we read that, that the author of Hebrews is going to expound to us as we go forward. In verse 9, Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the table of the covenant. And over it, the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. So he's just laying out. We, we saw before uh, Christ has a, a new, um, he has a, a new rest as we saw that is a new tabernacle that he uh, serves in a, a, a better tabernacle, the heavenly tabernacle, the pattern. And now he's showing us what the pattern uh, was made, that there was a tabernacle, that it had a, a first chamber when you enter in, that the first room that the uh, common priests would enter into and they would serve, uh, that was called the holy place. Uh, they entered in, there was the showbread, there was the candlestick for light and to show the goodness of God. There were the vestments that were in there for them to wear and to minister to before the Lord. And then entering past that through a second veil was the holiest place where the Ark of the Covenant was kept, where the tables of the law was kept, where the priest would enter in once a year with blood to make atonement for the people. And so he's just telling us that this old covenant had orders of service in this, that they entered in to serve with these implements. And so in verse 6, Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone, once every, every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. He's saying this is what they did. This is how they served. They would enter in often to the holy place, the, the place where they would commonly come to serve God. Uh, but only once a year would they come to the holiest place. In verse 8, the Holy Ghost, this signifying through uh, their service in the Old Testament, signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present in which were both uh, offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect, as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. What the Holy Ghost was signifying by the fact that they had to often enter in, by the fact that they had to come in by blood, by the fact that they uh, could not enter in once and serve God and leave on behalf of the people, but they had to come in often, was that they, uh, the way into the, the, the true uh, uh, holy place, the true dwelling of God was not manifest yet. Uh, because they only entered into the pattern, they only entered into the image, uh, they were not uh, finishing the work that they uh, needed in order to save their souls. And this is manifest in, in verse 10 when it says that they did carnal ordinances, that is fleshly ordinances, not even spiritual ordinances. They brought in physical blood, they did physical service, they laid out physical bread, and they had to undergo physical washings in order to enter in. Uh, but they... Uh, did not come in spiritually. They only came in physically. And that into the picture, not into the real thing. In verse 11 we read, But Christ, being come in high priest of good things to come, 
by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Christ entered in not to the uh, image of the tabernacle, not to the pattern that was shown to Moses of heavenly things, but he entered into the heavenly tabernacle. Uh, he entered in before God himself in heaven to present himself, his own death and burial and resurrection on behalf of the people. He entered in not with the blood of bulls and goats, but with his own blood he entered in once to the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. And he says that if the blood of bulls and goats, if the uh, sprinkling of them and the ashes of them uh, purified physically for physical service in a sign, in a symbol, then how much more did the blood of Christ cleanse and how much more can it actually cleanse us and and not just in the flesh but to serve the living god in our conscience and to purge us from dead works christ gave himself as a sacrifice and not just a physical sacrifice but a spiritual sacrifice for us also in verse 15, for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon neither is the first, testa uh, the first testament was dedicated without blood. So the, this is where the new covenant we see comes in. Uh, that without the shedding of man's blood, uh, without a man dying, then his last will and testament does not go into effect. The, the, the uh, covenant that God makes does not go into effect without the shedding of blood either. And here we see that Christ, when he died, when he gave his life, he brought into effect that promise of the covenant that God made. This is the covenant that I will make with my people. I will write my law in their hearts and establish the, the, the law in them. Uh, and I will be their God, they shall be my people. I will no longer remember their iniquity, I will forgive their sins. Christ did this, not with the, the blood of bulls and goats, not with the physical washing uh, that they had to undergo, but with his own self. He gave his life to establish this testament. And so if the Old Testament, the Old Covenant was established with the blood of animals, and with carnal ordinances, with physical things and only patterns of the heavenly things, then how much better is the covenant that Christ establishes with his own blood, with his own righteousness, with his own heavenly temple that he has prepared for him from the foundation of the world so that he can offer himself on our behalf and forgive us our sins. In verse 19, for when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry, and almost all things by the law uh, uh, purged 
with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the pattern of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Uh, established with blood and that with bulls and goats, the new covenant must be established with better sacrifices. And Christ's sacrifice does just that. And so he uh, gives his life to establish the covenant. In verse 25 then, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation." Uh, the, as we said before, the Old Testament priests, they had to often enter into the temple. Daily they had to come before the holy place, and they had to sprinkle with the blood of common sacrifices. They had to offer at the uh, altar before the tabernacle in the court. They always had to come in and daily present the showbread and eat of it before the Lord. They had to wash themselves continually to do the service before him. And once a year, every single year, the high priest had to wash himself and consecrate himself and enter in with the blood of the sacrifice of the people before the Ark of the Covenant and before the mercy seat of God. And he had to always sprinkle before the Lord. And a preacher once said this that uh, really uh, you know, touched my heart and had me to understand exactly what was going on in that, is that they were only allowed to, to come into the holiest place to sprinkle the blood and immediately to return out of it. They weren't even allowed to go in to wash the mercy seat from the blood. They would come in yearly and they would sprinkle the blood and they would leave. And every year when the priest would come in, he would see the blood stain on the Ark of the Covenant, on the mercy seat. As a reminder that every year the priest would have to come in and often give sacrifices because those sacrifices could never take away sin. But what we see Jesus do is, as it says, that uh, uh, now once in the end of the world he hath appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself and as it is appointed unto men once to die but after this the judgment so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation once Christ entered in not often not from the beginning of the world until now and not since his death until the end of the world does he have to continually go and offer himself as a sacrifice for sin but he did once he died once for us just as it is appointed to every man once to die and once to be judged Christ went and was judged one time for his people so that they could obtain eternal salvation. Christ is not judged twice. He is judged once on our behalf for our sins. We have a law in this country called the double jeopardy law that a man cannot be judged twice for the same crime. And this is what Christ uh, is uh, basing his sacrifice on before God that no one is judged twice for their sins and so Christ is judged one time for our sins forever
to make intercession for us. In, in chapter 10, verse 1, For the law, having a shadow of things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offer year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers, once purged, should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance, again made of sin every year, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. Under the old covenant, those sacrifices, those ordinances, were only as a reminder of sin. They only brought it back up. They dug up the, the old sins of the people and brought them before them and showed them that they were unrighteous and they could never take away sins. It brought it before them so that they could look to God in faith in his promise that he would forgive his people. But in verse 5, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, Jesus Christ, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and offerings for sins thou had, hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me, To do thy will, O God. And I think that this is the uh, key verse of Hebrews. And it, it chokes me up when I read it. And that when Christ saw that the sacrifices of the Old Testament were not able to take away sins, he says, sacrifices and offerings thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared for me. That God gave Christ a body to offer himself on our behalf, the once for all sacrifice, because those sacrifices couldn't take away sins, because our obedience to God could never cleanse us from unrighteousness. He says, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. When we looked uh, last week about how Christ was ordained as a priest, we saw he was ordained by the oath of God, by the promise of God, that God had appointed him to be a priest and Christ obeyed him. And this is what it meant by that, that Christ should come and give his life according to the heavenly pattern, according to the heavenly substance, to make atonement for us once for all. In verse 8, above when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offering and offering for sin, thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily, ministering and offering oft times the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin, forever sat down on the right hand of God, from hence expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. When he made his sacrifice, he didn't turn around and exit the sanctuary. He uh, didn't have to go back out of the presence of God, but he sat down, it said. The priests, when they came in and they sprinkled the blood and they saw the stain on the mercy seat and they remembered their sin, had to turn back around to rejoin the people. They couldn't stay in the holiest place. But Christ on our behalf goes in with his own blood and sits down. He has finished the work. No more to be done by anyone else. He has sanctified us by it. In verse 15, whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness for us. For after that he had said before, 
This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will write my law into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. For where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. The Holy Ghost bears witness to us as his people. Uh, the old sacrifices reminded people of sin every year. And this sacrifice of Christ, by which we have the Holy Ghost, reminds us of the forgiveness of Christ for us on our behalf. Always reminding us of that. The law was written on tablets of stone in the Old Testament and on the stony hearts of the people then, but now in a heart of flesh given to us that Jesus Christ has fulfilled these things on our behalf and that he is a better sacrifice for sin. In verse 19, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter in to the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not as forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. It's often that we take this passage uh, out of the context that it's found in, that is the context of Christ's atonement, that Christ has made us a way now by going in and sitting on the right hand of God. He's made us a way to come in after him, not to uh, make atonement for our own sins, not to give other sacrifices, but to have fellowship with him and his father and amongst ourselves. And he says, therefore, let us hold fast this profession till the end. Let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together because Christ died so that we could assemble together, so that we could have fellowship one with another and with Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so let us uh, look to him. Let us enter in by his blood, by the way that he's made for us, and let's not uh, forsake this so that we uh, can encourage one another, uh, goad one another to persevere in the faith. In verse 26, for if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, that is this truth of Jesus Christ, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy? who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. If we neglect this way, if we do not come to Jesus Christ as our mediator, there is no other sacrifice. His is the once for all sacrifice. The old sacrifices could not atone for sin. His is the last sacrifice acceptable before God. If we turn away from this, then there is no more sacrifice for sin. All we have is that fearful looking for of judgment. All we have is the fear of falling into the hands of the living God. And so he admonishes us when we come together in this church to fellowship as believers. Let us uh, exhort one another about the gospel, always teaching it to, uh, to one another, always goading each other toward faith in Christ. Because if any of us turn away from this sacrifice, 
if any of us have not entered in by that one way that Christ has given us, then there is no other sacrifice for sin. Verse 32, But call to remembrance the former days, in which after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great flight of afflictions, partly whilst ye were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst ye became companions of them that were so used. For ye had compassion of me in my bonds, and took joyful and uh, joyfully and spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an eternal substance. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward, for ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Again, he just says, do not cast away your confidence. Remember how you as a body persevered in those early days of your faith. And as a body, lay hold of this confidence of Jesus Christ. Do not cast it away. So that by your patience, your hope, and your faith towards God, you will receive his kingdom at his coming. And so with that, we'll just end our uh, this section of our study in the book of Hebrews, and uh, I'll just ask if there are any questions or comments at this point. All right, then. Well, uh, I hope that we can all see the sacrifice of Christ on our behalf, uh, that his uh, service to God uh, is the only service that can save us from our sins. And if there are any in here that think that they uh, are serving God to earn their way to heaven, uh, to earn the forgiveness of their sins, who think that they're doing a priestly service, a, a, a priestly office on their own behalf, then we cannot do it. Christ was the only one that can. If we are the, one, the only ones, or if, if we are the, the ones that are responsible for interceding on our own behalf before God, then at our death, our priestly service will end and there will be no more sacrifice for sin for us. But Christ is able to endure after our deaths. He is able by his sacrifice to utterly perfect us, to bring us completely to God and to save us. And so I pray that everyone in here has that faith in Jesus Christ by which we enter in through his blood. And now let's go to our Lord in prayer. Uh, Father God, we again come before you, and Lord, we thank you for your word. Uh, Lord, we thank you for uh, that better covenant that Christ gave his life for. Uh, we pray that we would go in that covenant power this week. Uh, Lord, help us to serve you. Uh, we pray that you'd place someone in our way that we can talk to about the mediator. And uh, Lord, we pray that where we've sinned against you, you'd forgive us. Lord, be with those that are not with us tonight to keep them safe and bring them back to us and give them comfort. Lord, we pray for our missionaries and our leaders. And Lord, we pray that you would keep us safe in the days ahead and bring us into the kingdom of your dear Son. And it's in his holy name we pray. Amen.